having the service corporation owned by a trust with, say, three members of the managing committee of the law firm being the trustees, and having the discretion on an annual basis to allocate or reallocate the shareholdings among the partners. So you can really have a notional or phantom shifting ownership. Now the good news is it is that arbitrary and you can achieve flexibility. The bad news is that partners can potentially be disenfranchised by that group of three who have that discretion to keep allocating and reallocating among the partners on a notional basis. I guess I should leave the remaining comments uh, to the question period. I apologize that, uh, that uh, I've overrun my time and overrun my material, but uh, I hope you'll find the rest of it uh, useful. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this morning is Mr. Michael Slan, who will talk about the dissolution of partnerships. Mr. Slan uh, is a graduate of Osgoode Hall and was called to the bar in 1978 and is currently a partner in Lyons, Arbus, and Goodman, uh, and has professional experience in this area. I suspect that he's one of the two people referred to by Peter, and he has acted, in fact, on partnership dissolutions. Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. My topic is dissolution, but really I'm talking as much about the avoidance of dissolution in many circumstances. Uh, I found a partnership agreement or a draft one in the uh, waste, waste paper bag the other day, and I just want to read you some, some, some points from a draft one that uh, will show you why uh, talks such as this on the proper effects of a dissolution are necessary. The agreement started like this. Whereas just about everybody wants something in writing, now therefore the parties will settle for the following. Any partner who has more than 15% is here and after sometimes known as a big hitter. In the case of disputes regarding partnership percentages, the principle to each according to his needs shall apply. All partners agree that big hitters have big needs. Associates shall be paid the going rate. The going rate shall mean the minimum salary that associates will accept before going. And it goes on. <laughs> the general rule will be that a uh, change in composition of a partnership causes a dissolution in the absence of an agreement <coughs> to the contrary. Some com commentators have indicated that where a firm has a history of partners leaving and the firm continuing, that in law there can be a continuation of the partnership. However, I don't believe that that point has been litigated at this, at, at this juncture. In the absence of an agreement, the provisions of the Partnership Act will apply unless the parties come to an agreement prior to the dissolution which would be effected. The Partnership Act, however, is far from exhaustive in creating a procedure for the orderly disposition of partnership assets. In fact, it's interesting when you think about it to contrast the approach that's taken in modern statutes with the approach that's taken in the Partnerships Act. And for example, if we would all think back to the remedy sections under the Personal Property Security Act for the rights which a secured party, the procedures which a secured party must follow in the event he wants to realize upon security with the provisions of the Partnership Act, you'll see that the PPSA contains a much more detailed course of action which a secured party is required to follow. The Partnerships Act takes a very broad brushstrokes and leaves us with very little guidance uh, when a partnership is dissolving. The Partnership Act provides that in the absence of an agreement, death or insolvency of a partner will cause a dissolution. It also provides that in the absence of an agreement, a partnership can be dissolved by notice. Even where there is an agreement between the parties, the Partnership Act provides that an application can be made to a court for a dissolution and can be granted where a, when a partner is found mentally incompetent or permanently incapable of performing his part of the partnership contract. As well, the Act provides that even where there is an agreement, the court can step in and cause a dissolution when a partner 
is willfully or persistently committing a breach of the partnership agreement or otherwise so conducts himself in matters relating to the partnership business that it is not reasonably practicable for the other partner or partners to carry on business in partnership with him. That's contained in Section 35 of the Act. The Act has, the Act says what to do but gives little guidance on how to do it. It is clear under the Act that the, in the event of a dissolution, in the event of a death of a member, the remaining partners have certain authority. But it's very unclear the extent of that authority. Section 38 says that after the dissolution of a partnership, the authority of each partner to bind the firm and the other rights and obligations of the partners continue notwithstanding the dissolution, so far as is necessary to wind up the affairs of the partnership and to complete transactions begun, but unfinished at the time of dissolution, but not otherwise. So real concerns arise as to how far the continuing partners can go and the surviving partners can go to continue to act in connection with the files of the partnership as at the time of dissolution, whether or not new files can be taken in uh, to the partnership or to the remaining partners uh, with respect to work that had been completed or goodwill that had been generated by the former partnership. These are questions which, for which there are no, no real answers. Questions arise in connection with the dissolution of a partnership as to what to do with the work in process. As I've said, Section 38 perhaps limits the ability to continue working on work in process for an extended period of time. I will deal with how remaining partners compensate withdrawing partners or the estate of a deceased former partner. Questions which we'll look at, if there's a dissolution, do you pay a survivor the book value of his work in process? Should the payment include a discount because work in process at its book value or at its docketed hours times the hourly rate doesn't really take into account the time it takes to convert the work in process into fees and further than that the time it takes to collect those fees once they've been billed. Do you pay for the book value of the work in process and add a percentage because historically fees are normally written up from the time spent on the files from the, from the normal hourly rate? What will become clear is that we have to analyze any particular firm and within our own individual environments to determine what is proper in these circumstances. More and more we have management systems and computer time docketing, but there's still a great number of partnerships where there is no central registry of time, work and process of the firm. And questions will, will necessarily arise as to what the actual value is of any of the work that's in the files and how you come about valuing it. In addition, where there is no agreement between, a, between parties, there's no opportunity to have the parties reach some new conclusion at a time where they may not be fighting as to how to govern their relationship. There may be stresses and strains between partners and a person contemplating withdrawing from the partnership. And if, if their relationship hasn't been set out in writing and the effects of a withdrawal haven't been set out in writing prior to a departure, there's more opportunity for disagreement. One of the examples of a difficulty in using the rules contained in the Partnership Act is that there's no reference as to what to do with the goodwill of the partnership. If we take an example where two partners buy a practice of a sole practitioner and they pay that sole practitioner an amount equal to one times the billions of his practice, then if they don't have an agreement, there can be real problems in the event one of the new partners dies. The deceased has shared the expense of purchasing the practice, but where there's no agreement, there may perhaps be no recovery for payment made to purchase the practice. And the resolution to these problems obviously is a partnership agreement. The advantages of an agreement is that 
it can get close to settling what will be paid to the withdrawing partner and how it will be paid. This not only avoids the possibility for arguments at a later time, but at least it provides certain planning possibilities to, the, uh, to all partners prior to an event which would give rise to a dissolution or withdrawal. There's some certainty in it. Either the values for certain of the assets of the partnership will be determined, or at least the method of the valuation will be determined. And again, it will reduce the opportunity for substantial disagreement between a survivor who remains in practice and the estate of, the, of a deceased partner. The question of what parties to an agreement should provide as compensation to a withdrawing partner, again, depends on all the circumstances of the partner's relationship to each other, the circumstances surrounding the withdrawal, the nature of the partnership, the nature of the partnership assets. I've put in the materials a decision chart which is at the back of the, of the lecture format. And I think that it's not, it, it's not an attempt to be exhaustive. It's only an attempt really to say that there's a number of factors which should be considered, a number of types of events of withdrawal or dissolution which could arise in which we should consider whether or not there are different applications, different rules which should be applied. <laughs> For example, take a three-lawyer partnership with partners who are in their late 30s or early 40s. The partnership has no associates. The firm is an all-litigation firm where the files have a long cycle of between two or three years. However, the firm has very little in terms of accounts receivable. There is profitability built into their fees as a result of the long carrying period for the work in process. And payment is generally made by trust transfer once, once the litigation has been settled. The clients of the firm are individuals. There are very few ongoing, does motor vehicle litigation, very few return clients. The firm has a small library, leases its premises, and has no assets that have increased in value since the time that they have been purchased. One partner, however, feels that he's over-contributing, that his share, his contributions to the firm exceed what he's been taking out of the firm and is looking to take a walk. If we think about it, all of the facts that I've outlined about the firm affect how the payment should be made and what the payment should be. I'd suggest that in this, in this example, the agreement should provide that his capital account be paid currently to him. The capital account represents past earnings on which he has paid tax, and it has been used to finance the firm and to finance that work in process. It represents actual cash which has been received by the firm because there, there's a small amount of accounts receivable. The only time where in the decision chart, I would say that he should be paid his capital account over time would be if he was entitled to earn interest at a reasonable rate over the period of time. With work in progress, it may be foolhardy today to pay him for his work in process, but in this firm that we've looked at, in this example, the final bill has write-ups which include the carrying costs. If the agreement provides that he's not to take those files with him, you'll have to weigh the trade-off between paying him now at what would otherwise be called the work and process's book value, or whether or not he takes that, and that's a deduction from the amount that he, that he takes. I think that it's important as partners not to make life impossible for a departing partner, for a departing partner. However, you have to weigh the balance of allowing the existing partners and the remaining partners to carry on with it without a severe financial drain on them. In this firm, in the example, I suggest that no payment be made on account of goodwill because of the nature of the practice. 
in the motor vehicle litigation practice, there's no recurring business. And the referral business, if it's analyzed, is probably likely to go to the lawyer and not to the firm. If we go back to the prior example where a firm was purchased and an amount equal to one times the billings of that firm was paid for the practice of a sole practitioner, their payment for, a good, for goodwill can definitely be rationalized and should be considered. If, the firm has, if a firm has recurring or ongoing work with a frequent billing cycle, there is perhaps little work in process with the firm. If the nature of the clients is such that they will stick with that firm, then perhaps a payment for goodwill is required. An agreement will not provide the proper compensation, a proper measure of compensation to withdrawing or deceased partner in all cases. And perhaps in every case, the compensation that the agreement will provide is a, is a trade-off and, and arbitrary. But it does give certainty. It does assist in avoiding disputes. And it will balance the rights between continuing it and withdrawing partners. There is also an, an advantage or a disadvantage of, in an agreement with respect to the asset valuation. You can place in an agreement a very arbitrary figure for the valuation of any type of asset. The, the type of arbitrary values you can put in for the assets of the partnership include the book value with specific depreciation rates. And if you look at the model partnership agreement, you'll see that, that it contains specific depreciation rates uh, for depreciation of leasehold improvements. You can require appraisal for fair market value of assets, which the partners realize are not reflect reflected properly on the, on the books of the partnership. And for example, a library often has a far greater worth than is reflected on the books of the partnership. And artwork often does today. And over the last few years, I'd suggest that certain equipment purchases may have valuations far less than what's carried on the books. The quick depreciation of telephone equipment systems and computer systems are things that should be looked at to determine whether or not your book values more or less reflect the fair market values or if, or if there's a substantial differ, differentiation that you have to take into an account. With goodwill, I don't know how you place a valuation on the asset other than in some arbitrary manner. My paper refers to what, to a, a quote from an article contained in the Law Society Gazette about what goodwill is. And it states that it's really, it's not a, a right to billings, it's really only a right to access certain clients. It doesn't guarantee in any way, shape, or form that you're going to to receive monies on account of the goodwill that's left with a firm. And you have to, again, look at the clients, look at the work that's being done in order to determine whether or not there is a goodwill factor in the firm. Goodwill is arbitrary, but you can't have guarantees stipulated with it. And the guarantees can relate to the work that, in fact, is done subsequent to the dissolution. However, that prolongs the relationship between partners and former partners and may not be appropriate in, in any particular circumstance. My paper talks about the difficulties with work in process and its valuation. And I think a good reference to that is contained in the article that I have uh, quoted from on page nine of the paper, page nine of my paper. And that's the article by um, Graham Brown, where he states, in the legal professional, corporate legal work is generally a function of time and rates, and value of an open file can generally be related to the number of hours to a specific date, estimates of hours to complete, rates per hour, and the value of the service. Litigation work, however, creates a much more difficult problem. Although we do not have a contingency fee environment in Canada, there definitely is a relationship between success of the case and the appropriate rate per hour applied to the hours in the docket. In addition, there is often a significant time span between the commencement of a case and the final closing of the file. 
Real estate work is generally not a function of hours, but rather a percentage of the value of the transaction. The question obviously arises, how should the fee be proportioned at any given time? Is there any value pertaining to time if a deal fails to close? If the real estate transaction comes into your office, you've quoted a fee, you know the amount of work involved, but it's day one, and you're just waiting for your search of title back. How do you know at any given date, at any given date giving rise to a withdrawal or dissolution of the partnership, how do you know how to value that goodwill, how to, how to value that work in process? As well, you have to make adjustments for contingent liabilities. Today, with new leases, market softening, your lease can be an asset, but it can also be a contingent liability for the continuing partners who have to carry on the firm and have a liability for increased space, space which included the space occupied by the partner who has left the firm. And you have to take that into, into an account. And perhaps you set a formula for reviewing what the value of the lease is with respect to the space and what the value is to the continuing partners. What I think that this shows is two things which can be suggested for inclusion in a partnership agreement. One is even where you have formulas, you should perhaps include an escape clause to get yourself out of the formula that you've agreed to pay. And the escape clause can be that the continuing part partners will elect to dissolve the partnership in certain circumstances, notwithstanding the fact that the agreement calls for um, the continuation. The example that I've given in the paper about where that is appropriate is if you have two partners who withdraw within a short period of time, you may have an agreement which says that the firm is to continue notwithstanding a withdrawal of a partner, but you realize when the, the second partner goes six months later that to pay him out on that formula basis would cause substantial hardship to the partnership. So I suggest that, that you include a clause providing that within a certain time frame, the partners can re-elect to have the firm dissolve and the dissolution procedures contained in the agreement to apply. The decision chart is helpful in causing us to contemplate the timing of payments to partners. And let's consider some of the, the different types of events that will give rise to a change in the composition of the partnership and discuss whether or not the timing of those payments should, should differ to a partner. On death, a spouse may require a capital base. And accordingly, I generally believe that whatever the valuation is, it should be paid currently or over time with interest to that spouse. Where a partner is withdrawing to competition, it's a different story. Obviously, there are competing interests where the continuing partners don't want to assist the withdrawing partner in establishing his own business. And they do not want to cause hardship to the remaining partners. Accordingly, where there is some dislocation caused by the fact of a partner withdrawing to competition, consider some payments now, some payments over time with no interest to compensate for the time it takes the remaining partners to get up to scratch and to, and to bring their firm practice back up. This can again be a problem. This payment over time can again be a compensating factor to the fact that the remaining partners have a lease for a, greater amount, a larger amount of space than they need and are probably going to have some difficulties readjusting to the, themselves to the loss of the partner. 
in an expulsion situation. I believe that you should, shouldn't take it too far. It may be true that the partner who is, who is being expelled from the firm has hurt the firm in ways that have not, uh, in ways that have uh, caused the firm to have its income decreased. But I don't believe that in an expulsion situation, you should penalize the former partner by turning off his ability to reach some of his capital, if not all of it, so that he can go on earning a living elsewhere. My paper also includes some considerations uh, with respect to non-competition <coughs> covenants that may be contained in partnership agreements. I am more or less not in favor of them because I believe that uh, a lawyer should have the right to go on and practice no matter where. But where there are goodwill provisions and where a partner is being compensated for it, it is necessary to consider whether or not some form of non-compete is required. The general rule, as we, as we know, is that where there is a vendor is selling an interest in a business, a covenant restraining the vendor from competing with the purchaser will be effective if it is reasonable considering the interest of the respective parties and also the interest of the public. The courts have made a distinction between covenants between employees and their employers and vendors of a business because the vendors of the business have equal bargaining position. And I think it is fair to say that a partner in a partnership would generally be considered to have an equal bargaining position with his remaining partners. And the same standards which would apply to a vendor of a business would apply to a partner who executes a restrictive covenant. However, it is clear from the case law as well that one must look to all the, all the circumstances and the agreement as a whole. So I think that it would be, a court would be allowed to look at both the nature and extent of the covenant and whether or not the agreement itself calls for the payment on account of goodwill. And those factors will all be looked to together to determine whether or not the covenant will be enforceable. You must obviously look at the normal, con normal concepts, time limitations, geographical limitations, the scope of the prohibited activities, whether or not it's, uh, whether or not it's all clients, whether or not it's only the uh, servicing the, the former firm's clients, or mere, merely just soliciting work from the, the firm's former clients, but allowing them to take work elsewhere. I asked um, Alan Marshall, uh, the head of the practice advisory service of the Law Society, the extent to which the Law Society will get involved in partnership disputes. And basically, the answer that he gave me is that they will not be involved in any way to arbitrate between partners and former partners. They will recommend the appointment of counsel two partners who are fighting. And I, and I think that it's, it's one area that if there is a serious dispute amongst partners, the old saying that uh, you'll have a fool for a client if you act for yourself is appropriate. Um, the practice advisory service will assist you in, in getting the forms necessary to get client directions and the like. But they will only go in. There is a provision in the Law Society Act for them to go in to manage the practice only where it's necessary for the protection of the clients and generally won't be involved where the partners are fighting amongst themselves. However, it's, I guess it's clear and obvious that the more dissension there is, the, the greater the likelihood that all partners who are fighting over certain clients will lose the clients to some other party and no one will retain that particular client. And perhaps it's one area where, where disputes do arise. Counsel can assist you in maintaining that client 
contact um, because it's, the council may be able to diffuse the relationship between the parties. The, uh, in conclusion, I, I'll just read you a couple of more provisions from that uh, partnership agreement that I found, which talks about what happens in the event of a resignation or dissolution of a partnership. One of the provisions contained in this agreement says that any part partner may resign by tendering his or her written resignation to the big hitters or any one of them. Any partner may, re may resign by the big hitters tendering the resignation to itself of such partners on such partner's behalf. Either type of resignation shall be deemed voluntary. And one other comment about how, the, how a firm is governed. The firm shall be governed by committees. The initial appointment of members to committees shall occur mystically. Thereafter, committees shall be self-perpetuating. Again, these are some of the things that you should, you should avoid to avoid the problems on dissolution. Thank you. The uh, other panelists this morning have dealt with the ta technical and practical aspects of running a law partnership. I would like to end this morning by looking very briefly at some of the trends that, in my view, are going to affect the nature of partnerships as a professional organization in which most of us practice. We all know that we're living in an era of tremendous change. Uh, many of us, including myself, are somewhat uneasy about these changes. We don't know where we're going. I guess the one thing that we do know, and if I can quote Claire Bernstein, the uh, legal writer in the Globe and Mail, lawyers can't go home again. There are many factors that could be discussed in this area, and some of them have been touched on this morning, such as the large number of graduates, the growth of in-house counsel, the possibility of paid public defenders in Ontario, and a variety of other factors in the community which are going to affect our law partnerships. I would like to look at four trends briefly that, in my view, will, are, will directly change the nature of a law partnership as we know it. These are the growth of law firms, national and international <coughs> partnerships, advertising by lawyers, and finally and briefly, incorporation of law practices. Turning first to the growth of law partnerships, there are now several firms in Toronto with over 100 lawyers, and their growth is accelerating rapidly. There are law firms now in the United States with over 700 lawyers. By 1990, if the trend continues, and I believe it will, there will in all likelihood be firms in the United States with over 1,000 lawyers, and possibly also in Canada. This phenomenon of growth is not just a large metropolitan phenomenon. It's, uh, firms in smaller centers are growing rapidly through amalgamations, mergers, or just the increased demand for legal services. I think lawyers can learn a lot from their fellow professionals, the chartered accountants, on how to cope with growth in a professional partnership. After all, don't forget that they also practice in partnerships. And to give you some idea of the relative size, yesterday in the Globe and Mail was an article on the um, imminent merger between Pricewaterhouse and Deloitte's. In the United States, Pricewaterhouse has 1,900 partners, Deloitte's has 2,200 partners. But I think that our fellow professionals, the accountants, have recognized certain basic truths about large professional partnerships, and what they have learned and accepted could be of use to all of us, no matter what size of partnership we're involved in. First of all, they accepted long ago the fact that they are involved in a business, and the very best of their partners are involved in the management of the practice. Unlike most, if not all, law firms, the, the chairmanship, for example, of a large chartered accountancy partnership is the highest paid and most prestigious job, and you can be sure that the chairman of such a firm doesn't spend his time looking at notes to financial statements or reviewing minute books in some lawyer's office. Um, compare that to a law firm where the managing partner's job is taken on grudgingly, it's rotated from year to year, or it's put in the hands of committees who, again, view it grudgingly and as, as a very secondary activity to the practice of law. I submit that for law partnerships to grow and to survive, 
management functions must be given equal weight to the practice of law, both in terms of prestige and remuneration. Uh, as a corollary to this, I believe that law firms like chartered accountancy practice are going to have to hire proper professional managers to run their practices. To a certain extent, this is now in place in large metropolitan firms, but I believe the same principles apply to a small two-man practice. As I mentioned in my paper, if, if the lawyers in a two-man practice spend approximately $25,000 a year in billable time on management matters, it may be economically feasible to go out and hire a young business person to do the same functions and probably do it better. Another reason why accountants have coped with growth better than us, in my view, is their willingness to accept new technology. Now, to a certain extent, it was forced on them by their clients with the computerization of accounting. But as I'll discuss a little later under advertising, I think it's going to be forced on us by our clients in the near future. Another area where I believe they are superior to us is in the question of marketing their professional practices. And it's not just explained by the wider latitude of their professional rules dealing with advertising. Uh, accountants recognized long ago that clients require or, or, or need ongoing information services. Just think of the uh, bulletins that you receive from chartered accountancy firms around budget time. Lawyers tend to act, react to legal problems as they come in and forget that there's a real need on the part of clients to have ongoing information services. And again, it's not just a big firm phenomenon. If you think of a smaller practice, how many smaller pra lawyers in smaller practices think of contacting clients for whom they prepared wills five years ago to see if uh, a new will should be done because of changing tax circumstances or changing family circumstances? So far, I've dealt with how to cope with growth I think a fundamental question is whether or not a partnership should grow, and this should be a conscious decision. I think too often we as lawyers forget that growth has certain disadvantages as well as advantages. We all know about the advantages, probably more financial security, wider base of clients, more specialization. But we tend to forget that decision making is much harder in a larger practice. And also, growth entails increased overhead, and therefore, more pressure on partners to bill more to pay for the overhead. However, most law firms still grow by chance uh, without any planning. And American writers who have looked at the growth of, of law firms, and as uh, Chris Osborne mentioned this morning, there, there have been extensive studies done in this area. American writers state that if a law firm grows by chance rather than with long-range planning, the result is often a disaster. Uh, the first point to consider in terms of growth is, is to consider other alternatives. Uh, one that we often forget is the increased use of paralegals. Recently in Toronto, a presentation was put on in a seminar on computers and the law by a partner in a Kansas City law firm that has 16 lawyers and over 100 paralegals. Now the billings of that firm would probably exceed the billings of the largest Canadian firm. And I, I suspect that that kind of ratio in Ontario today is unrealistic, but my point is that we often forget that the hiring of new lawyers is not necessarily the only answer to dealing with an expanding practice. Um, if a decision is made to grow, American writers in the field say that there are three key areas, manpower planning, space planning, and financial planning, and again, these have been touched on by this morning's speakers. In terms of manpower planning, it's a question of whether or not you hire new graduates from the bar ad or perhaps more experienced associates. Again, we tend to think of growth in terms of hiring new associates, forgetting that a brand new lawyer out of the bar admission course requires a lot of time in terms of supervision and training. And if he or she doesn't get it, they're going to leave or morale is going to be poor. Uh, the other key area is space planning. This is more an urban firm problem. Uh, but again, it simply means predicting future needs as much as possible and providing space in terms of subletting in advance or options on space rather than rushing out when the need actually arises and obtaining <coughs> new space at an uh, increased cost. The third area is financial planning, and I concede that this is the most difficult for our profession because we never know from year to year how our practices are going to grow, what clients are going to come in, and what clients are going to leave.
However, with the increasing sophistication of computer, computer budgeting predictions, it's possible for firms of all sizes to do some kind of budgeting and planning. And the main advantage of computers, so I'm told by the experts, is that the programs can be changed immediately as changes arise in the practice. In summary, on the question of growth, I believe that growth should be a, uh, the result of a conscious decision on the, partner, on, on the part of partners in a law firm. And secondly, if we are going to survive this phenomenon of growth in our profession, we are going to have to become more businesslike and recognize that growth entails increased management responsibilities and supervision, and that the people who do them should be compensated, certainly financially and in terms of prestige. This is not a, a, a commercial, but I should mention that the uh, uh, Law Society has an excellent practice advisory service, which I believe uh, offers uh, consulting services for free to practices of all sizes in terms of many of the areas that I've touched on, particularly long-range planning. I'd now like to turn to the question of national partnerships. Uh, whether we like it or not, they're here to stay, notwithstanding some recent legal reversals. Uh, in fact, I think that they've been here for a long time in the form of the close associations that have existed for many years between firms in different cities. I also submit that the growth of national firms will not only, be, will not only affect firms in large metropolitan centers, but those of you practicing in smaller centers sooner or later are going to feel the effects. And Again, I believe that the experience of the, the chartered accountancy profession in this field uh, is uh, an illustration of what happens. In, in chartered accountancy, I believe that the national firms were fir formed first in major cities. But once most major cities had a branch office of the particular firm, it's only a question of time but before they started to expound, expand outwards into smaller centers. There are several reasons given for justifying national firms. You're all aware of them. I'll just touch on them briefly. The main one is that the, the national scope of business and the fact that businessmen like to deal with the same lawyers and receive the same consistency of, of, of service coast to coast. Another reason put forward is that the national firms are consistent with the mobility rights in the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights. Uh, it's also suggested that national firms encourage national unity. Uh, the main arguments against are that basically the growth of national firms is an attempt by certain large Toronto and Montreal firms to expand their practices into new areas of the country where commercial activity has moved from the traditional centers of Toronto and Montreal. Secondly, that the needs of large business organizations have not changed that much over the years and they've been well served by, uh, by the close association referral method. Uh, another major criticism is the perceived effect on local bars, that local bars will be relegated to carrying out unsophisticated routine legal work. And finally, there's the problem of enforcement uh, of provincial law societies of their rules and regulations against lawyers who nominally practice in the jurisdiction but in fact reside elsewhere. Um, as usual, the United States is ahead of us in this area. The national firms developed there in the 1920s. They were actually forbidden at first but uh, again, the pressures grew after the Second World War, and by 1970, the American Bar Association adopted a code in effect permitting national partnerships under the same name. This code has been adopted by all but seven states, and national law firms are a fact now in the United States. There was a recent article in Business Week on a firm called Finley Cumble, which may be a sign of the times to come. Finley Cumble has gone from something like 12 lawyers to over 400 lawyers in three years. Um, on national coast to coast, they are, in effect, and they admit this, a franchise operation. They approach firms and cities, say, you can use our name, we'll refer clients to you. In return, the profits are pooled nationally and distributed. One of their critics called it a loose federation based on greed, but they seem to be surviving and prospering. 
In Canada, the uh, question of national law firms was looked at in 1982 by the Federation of Law Societies, and a report was put out under the chairmanship of Martin Friedman of Winnipeg. The, the main recommendation of the report was that law societies should permit national firms without actively encouraging them. They considered all the arguments and felt that the jury was out on all the pros and cons. However, there was a very strong dissent uh, rendered by Mr. Fraser, one of the members of the committee from Calgary, and his main concern was the effect of national firms on local bars. He called it a devastating effect and cited the uh, experience of the chartered accountancy profession. As all of you know, this whole issue of national firms has arisen over the last two or three years because of the attempts by one uh, major Toronto firm to become a national firm. Um, the, the firm is McCarthy McCarthy and they tried to amalgamate with an Alberta firm. The whole matter came before the courts last summer because the Law Society of Alberta passed two rules in effect forbidding <coughs> national firms in their jurisdiction. Uh, the judgment of Mr. Justice Day to my knowledge has not been reported yet but simply put he came out uh, fully supporting the Alberta Law Society rules and uh, held that they did not uh, infringe the mobility rights and the freedom of association rights in the Charter. However, if you don't believe the trend is here, as one of the panelists mentioned earlier, there was an announcement last week in the Toronto Papers that the same firm has amalgamated with uh, an 80-man firm in Vancouver subject to the approval of the the two uh, law societies having jurisdiction. What I think is important here is that we're seeing a fundamental change in the perception of a law firm. There's not a law firm in Canada in which every partner does not know every other partner, at least by name, and in most cases much better than that. Compare that to a large national chartered accountancy firm where a partner in Toronto probably knows less than one quarter of his partners by sight, by name, or whatever. Also, I believe that when national firms come into being, as they're going to, they are going to have an effect on smaller centers in that they will move into smaller centers, large organizations have their own built-in growth, uh, and within the next few years, if my predictions are right, many of you in smaller centers will be faced with the issue whether to compete with a local branch of a national firm or in fact become a branch of a national firm. I should just mention briefly the question of international firms. Uh, I was not aware of this until I read Mr. Fraser's dissent, but in the late 1970s, certain American firms apparently tried to move into Calgary to carry out securities work on behalf of their American clients during the boom years uh, in Alberta. They were, of course, rebuffed immediately uh, by the Law Society of Alberta, but again, the trend is there, and maybe 10 years from now, that will be the ma major issue facing Canadian lawyers. Advertising, to me, is another phenomenon that's going to have a tremendous effect on all our law partnerships. Uh, my personal view is that public pressure will, before long, lead to new rules in this area. And one event more than <coughs> any uh, indicates to me that I'm right. As probably most of you are aware, on October 1st of this year, that bastion of conservatism, the Law Society of England and Wales, changed its rules to permit advertising on, on the part of solicitors. And not just informational advertising, meaning price advertising, but also promotional advertising, provided it's not derogatory to other practitioners and firms and is done in good taste. This development in the UK did not go on notice in our press, and in fact, the, Tor the Toronto Star had an editorial entitled, Why Not Lawyers for Ads, citing that it's time that Canadian lawyers removed the restrictions and allowed advertising. The effect of advertising on practices has been extensively studied in the United States, and writers divide legal services into two types, what they call standardized services. These are the prep non-contested, um, simple legal procedures involving routine documents, preparation of simple wills, non-contested divorces. The other type of services are individualized services defined as services involving a high degree of risk to a client because of the consequences to his life, liberty, or property. Obviously, in this category is litigation of all types, complex business transactions, tax matters. 
Studies have found that advertising has had little effect on individualized services. The recipient of such services, be he a well-known criminal or a corporate executive wanting estate planning services, interacts all the time with people in the same predicament and can get good referrals. However, advertising does have a tremendous effect on standardized services in that many members of the public who up until now have not consulted lawyers because they think we're all too expensive realize that, uh, that the preparation of a will, for example, will cost a hundred dollars, not a thousand dollars as they heard in some bar. With this area of growth, cost becomes a governing factor and law firms therefore have to become more modern in terms of using modern technology such as word processing and better utilization of their personnel, increased use of law clerks, for example. I'm not trying to say that the traditional ways of building business, word of mouth referrals and general reputation, are not going to be important. But I think that a firm that ignores the, uh, the, the delivery of standardized ser uh, services, assuming we're going to get advertising, and doesn't modernize to provide these services at a low cost is going to be in trouble because these same studies have shown that clients who come in for the first time for standardized services will usually go back to that firm for individualized services. Um, finally, I'd like to just touch briefly on the question of incorporating law practices. Uh, to my knowledge, they're only permitted in Alberta at the moment. Uh, in Alberta, a lawyer must be a director and shareholder of his professional corporation, but non-lawyers may be officers, which uh, does permit some kind of income splitting of the type referred to in Peter McQuillan's paper. Um, the professional corporation may carry on other businesses. However, the corporation has unlimited liability in all its business and professional activities. I'm not aware of any strong movement in Ontario today to, to uh, encourage or ask for the incorporation of practices, but my view is that as long as the unlimited liability factor remains, uh, who can be hurt, and all of us could get some tax benefits assuming that they remain or they're expanded in uh, the budget next spring. In conclusion, I think that the that there are developments and trends in the marketplace that are going to drastically change the current perception of a law practice in the next few years. And if I think there's a common theme among all of these trends and a common theme among many of the papers put forward this morning, we're all going to have to become more businesslike, more efficient, and we're going to have to devote more of our efforts to it, even though most of us would prefer uh, to practice law rather than manage the practice. But who knows, the uh, trends may result in a new form of partnership or professional entity with enhanced professional and financial benefits for all of us. Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, sorry. Are there any questions? We have a question period. Uh, Well, thank you very much all for attending, and I'd like to thank the panelists for their excellent uh, presentation. Thank you all. <laughs>